Jim Driver and welcome to my latest video. I'm back with another dive into the musical gold mine that was the 1980s. I think there's a very big possibility you might find your next favourite band. So please keep watching to the end. We all know about the big bands of the 1980s. I'm going to be talking about five more British bands from the 1980s that absolutely should have been huge. Some of these legends even managed to play the recently demolished Cricketers Pub in South East London that I used to book the bands from 1982 to 1990. And it was right by the Oval at Creek Ground, just in case you're stuck as to where it was. It's not there now, so you can't find it if you wanted to. So what are we waiting about for? Let's Let's get started. I want to talk about are the Cardiacs, a band I put on several times at the Cricketers and also upstairs at the Clowndon in the ballroom there, which was like a very nice big ballroom. I think it held about 800 people at Hammersmith. They were doing something you would never ever hear anywhere else. The live shows were anarchic and theatrical, almost like a surreal circus on acid with frontman Tim Smith as the ringmaster. Tracks like Is This The Life? Is this the life? How do, you, how do you pronounce that? Is this the life? Is this the life? Captured that manic energy and quirky brilliance that could only come from the Cardiacs. An era where bands often followed trends, they stood out by doing something completely their own. Aside from Tim, the people I remember in the Cardiacs were his brother Jim on guitar and Sarah, who was a sax player, who later married him and became his wife. Not to mention the manager, who was called Mark Wormsley, who was a bit of a character as well. I think he was quite posh, actually, but he was an eccentric. The Cardiacs were really a creative entity, actually, and he was part of that. And in fact, I'm told he was the one who planted the story in the Sunday sport tabloid Sunday newspaper about Tim and Sarah being brother and sister even though they were married. John Peel, for some reason, never gave them a Radio 1 live music session, though they did later go on to Janice Long and, I believe, Mark Riley. But I can remember one gig in the summer of 1992 when Radiohead supported them at a sellout show at the Astoria Theatre in London as West End. But unfortunately, that was the same year when things started to go horribly wrong. First of all, just after the um, show at the Astoria, Rough Trade Records went bust without shipping out any copies of their album, Heaven Born and Ever Right. It was eventually released on their own Alphabet Something Company label, but the impetus had gone. Band members started to leave and often they weren't replaced. And after a while, rather than being a quirky band with keyboards and synths and saxophones and things, it just became a guitar band. Very complicated, very interesting, but it wasn't the same. And I think that's really where things started to change for the band and it started to go on the decline. The real end came, unfortunately, when Tim Smith suffered a cardiac arrest, some might call it ironic, after leaving a My Bloody Valentine show in London in June 2008. And he suffered brain damage from which he never actually recovered. Unfortunately, Tim died in July 2020. R.I.P. Tim Smith. Next, we're going to be talking about Blurt, featuring the irrepressible Ted Milton. Now, Blurt wasn't your typical post-punk band. They blended punk energy with jazz improvisation, with Milton's manic saxophone and spoken word vocals, and of course his puppetry, because he's also a well-known puppeteer, believe it or not. Blur may have been too avant-garde for mass appeal, but they were one of those bands that you, well, when you saw them, you had to go back and see them again. And I saw them there following just gently rise and rise every show that they did. Poet and puppeteer Ted Milton was, and still is, I'm pleased to say, an electrifying performer. 
Ted was a noted beat poet from the late 1950s and he was featured in several key anthologies of the 1960s, including Children of Albion. I think it was Penguin who did that. Poetry of the Underground was the subtitle. And he has a puppetry sequence, believe it or not, featured in Terry Gilliam's film Jabberwocky. How's that for making it, eh? I book blurt at the cricketers as often as I possibly could. First few times, his brother Jake was playing it. My brother Jake. Drums. And I didn't know at the time that Jake was actually the drummer in Quintessence, a band I saw many, many times in my hippie period. And I think he had long hair then, but with blurt, he had short hair. But whoever was in the band, Ted would be bouncing around the stage, sax in hand, spilling out lyrics like a man possessed and that's what made blurt special raw unpredictable energy ted's still going now aged 81 performing with blurt and producing great handmade books like this one just let you know there's plenty more to come but don't go away but i just want to say if you like this and if you think you're finding out things that you didn't know and you're enjoying it please press the like icon thing you know the um, thumbs up thing and if you're not already yet subscribed please subscribe so if you know anybody who's got great taste please share this video with them now back to the bands <laughs> Because the copyright restrictions in YouTube mean I can't play long stretches of video, I've made a playlist and there's a link to it in the description and the comments. Now, here's a band that should have been much bigger than they actually were. Now, people are going to say in, in the comments that they, oh, they had lots of hits and they were very famous at the time. But yeah, yeah. The debut album had everything. Anthemic songs, soaring vocals from Ian McNabb, and that perfect mix of post-punk and 1980s pop. The Article Works had a top 20 single, Love is a Wonderful Colour, in the UK in 1989, as well as another one, a top 40 hit in the United States and Canada, with Whisper to a Screen, Bert's Fine, that makes no sense, doesn't it? Somehow, they didn't maintain that impetus and that they became one-hit wonders, though, unusually, one-hit wonders with two different one-hits. That's interesting, isn't it? I think the times are changing faster than they were. I think Ian McNabb wanted to do his own thing. And and although the Asker Works never played at the Cricketers, a lot of these northern bands didn't really play at London pubs. That They preferred to wait until they were like quite big and play larger venues. I'll play someone like the Marquee or something like that. But I did encounter Ian McNabb a little later when I worked at Time Out London, the magazine, in the music section. And I was given a CD, a well, big pile of them, called Head Like a Rock was this one and it was by Ian McNabb and I and it's still one of my favourite albums now and I gave it a blinding review and they were put forward for the Mercury Music Prize and believe it or not lost out to M people go oh. see there's no justice in this world and anyway it was a fantastic Thing. And as I say, it's, I've still got tr tracks on that on my um, playlist now. I'm alive and feeling pretty. Now I know it's me in this guitar. Guitar! Other little known facts you might not know about Ian McNabb include he is singing backing vocals on the first three Lightning Seas albums. He also played on stage with Ringo Starr. And Finally, before Asgore Works, he was an actor and he auditioned for the part of Barry Grant in the Channel 4 soap, Brookside. Bet you didn't know that. You're not going to find these things on Top of the Pops 2, are you? Well, you might do, but I wouldn't know because they me watch it. Next, we're going to talk about the jazz butcher. Led by the brilliant and eccentric Pat Fish, they never really fit into any one genre. One minute you, you get jangly pop, the next minute it's actually um, surrealist stuff, satire, 
all kinds of things. Might be a bit of jazz in there, a bit of rock. Who knows? But they were really good when they played at the Cricketers, and they did play at the Cricketers. They were another one. They were unpredictable in the best way possible. Pat Fish had a wicked sense of humour, and that's really what drove the band and what the Jazz Butcher was all about, really, to be honest with you. That's what set them apart from the rest. They didn't take themselves too seriously, which I always like that with, with acts that don't take themselves too seriously. No, I didn't say band then, because I think that when I talk about bands, it's not all bands, is it? There are people who are solo artists. So, I mean, Rob Roy Harper, for example, does he take himself too seriously? I don't know. Perhaps he does. Maybe he did. He does it now. Sadly, Pat Fish passed away recently, but his music lives on. It's still as weird and wonderful now as it was back then. And they were frequent visitors at the Cricketers, as I say. Let me tell you, those gigs were something special. It was like being part of something that was, I don't know, the 1980s, there were lots of things happening. And, and when you at shows like that, it made the job worthwhile, let's just say that. That's why I think the 1980s were a very good time in British music. Where's the juice? Where's the juice, man? Somebody open a cage, because the monkey's busting loose. Now we're talking about the Screaming Blue Messiahs. Now, the Screaming Blue Messiahs, I knew two members of the band before I knew the band, basically. I knew Kenny Harris, the drummer, probably through the men they couldn't hang. And we did a few things together. One of them was I got, because he's quite a big chap, big uh, Scotsman, and I got quite a few big chaps that I knew to help me do security at punk gigs because I used to be asked to do security at punk gigs and I found that if you just had like a load of people who were slightly older than the people who were causing trouble they didn't get any sort of hassle and Kenny was one of those though as they kept saying that they're not really fighters and I knew Chris Thompson who's the bass player from when I drank in Putney and I think I see him in the White Lion and in the Half Moon Putney I must have known Bill because he was in a band with I think Kenny was it or was it Chris? I, I can't remember now. But Bill and one of them was in a band called Motor Boys Motor with a guy called Tony, who was the lead singer. I mean, when they turned up, they okay, hello, how are you doing? And they were all, only three of them. And they'd go on stage and they wouldn't do a really long set because I don't think they actually could because Bill just put everything into that performance. I mean, he was jumping around, writhing on stage. He was sweating. At the end of it, he literally had to put ice on his head. It was like... Must have been a nightmare for him. He was like such a manic performer and it was so good. I mean, they were all perfectly excellent. They, they, they won those bands. The first time they played them, I booked them on spec and again, didn't know much about them. And they turned up and they had a support band, obviously. Quite a, quite a small crowd. But everybody who was there, I mean, the bar staff as well, were left open mouth at the end of it. It was amazing. The next time that they played, there were 100 people there. Then the next time there were 150 there and it got like that until they were too big to play there. They had, I think it's a top 20 hit, it, well, it was certainly quite a big hit called Wanna Be a Flintstone. And that was like, that wasn't their best, I'll tell you, but it was like, it, it was basically a cross between what they were like and a fairly commercially easy to do, get song. For some reason, I think it must have something to do with their management, I don't know. They would come back, now bear in mind that Bill used to put all this into the shows and they'd come back and they'd be broke. I know Chris, I think he was a painter or a plaster or something. He had to come back and do, and get jobs painting or plastering. I know with Kenny, that's the same thing which is crazy. So, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed it, please like, please follow, subscribe, or whatever you want to do, share it, etc. And I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.